Welcome to the uh, Arlington County Transportation Commission. This is the first meeting, uh, January 7th of 2021. We have three new members joining us this evening, and I believe all three new members are, are here. Uh, first being uh, Commissioner uh, Kesselwerk. Uh, next would be Commissioner Maritovic, and third being Commissioner Bruno. So welcome. So this is a new start time. Traditionally, we started at 7.30, but uh, the commission decided to push this up to 7 o'clock. And with that, I'll turn it over to the chairman. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Best. I also would like to uh, welcome all of our uh, new commissioners um, and apologize in advance for likely butchering your last names over the course of the meeting. Um, with that said, I think we can go ahead um, and remind folks uh, common teams etiquette. If you are not actually speaking, please keep yourself muted at all times. And uh, beyond that, commissioners, uh, just please raise your hand in teams if you uh, are ready to ask a question or make a comment and wait for me to call on you. If you, for some reason you do not have the raise hand icon, you can go right ahead and just uh, put something in the chat and I can call on you based on. And call the first item, Mr. Best. The first item, item number one, is citizen comment, and we have no speakers for this item. So item two, proposed process for renaming county parks, facilities, and streets. And we have Jennifer Smith here from the county manager's office. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. And I just want to say Happy New Year to everybody. Um, I look forward to a 2021. And thank you for all your service on the commission as well, um, both the people who have served for some time and the people who are new. Um, so uh, I am here tonight to um, you know, share some information that the county manager shared at the last board meeting with board members um, regarding, as Mr. Slatt said, the proposed, um, a new policy for naming uh, county streets, uh, facilities, et cetera. Um, and there is a current policy right now in parks um, and there's, um, I guess some policy right now on streets. Uh, so this is just an extension um, of, of that. So with that, I'm going to hopefully successfully share my screen. Uh, let's see. Give me just a moment here. Okay, can people see that? Yes. Should be a title slide. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move ahead uh, about seven slides, so it, I won't take too much of your time tonight. I, I've looked at your agenda and you have a lot on there. Um, the objective was to create um, really one policy and associated criteria for naming and renaming county parks, facilities, and streets. Um, so that was kind of the, the primary objective here. Um, we did do some research. Um, I'll just cover that in brief. Uh, we had a uh, online feedback form, which was part of the Dialogues and Race and Equity Assessment. Um, and we asked people kind of, what do you think about using a, a, the parks policy as kind of a base? Um, and then we also asked, um, what types of things do you think should be um, criteria for naming? Uh, we've had, as of, I don't know, about a week ago, uh, about uh, nearly 3,000 responses. So that's been great. Um, of course, we reviewed the parks policy, um, the street naming policy, and the school's policy for uh, buildings that they have. And then, of course, we looked at some other processes from, from other places as well. Um, it, it, you might not be surprised to know that different places have kind of slightly different, different processes. So um, this was the proposed process. I'm going to pause for just a minute. Um, I don't know if you see what's on my screen. It's somebody waiting. OK, there we go, in the lobby. Um, this is kind of a summary of the uh, process, and uh, there was a document that was um, kind of a, a slightly longer version of this, but this is a pretty good summary in the next couple of slides. Um, the, uh, first of all, uh, a community member or community organization um, or a commission or the county manager or the county board would submit a name change 
for a county park, street, or building for consideration. Um, now, those would be um, received at two different specific, two different dates during the year, and those dates would be published annually so that um, everyone would know when they are. Um, and we would have, as part of that process, you know, justification for the change, background on the new proposed name, that kind of thing. Um, the submissions would then be posted on the Engage Arlington webpage for public review and comment. And the submissions would then be reviewed on a, on a rolling basis um, at two different dates identified at six month intervals um, by a county manager appointed panel. Um, and the panel would break recommendations then to the county manager for county board consideration again twice a year. Um, and I just wanna note, um, this is really for, for renaming uh, the county, um, you know, there are already processes when a new park's coming online or perhaps a brand new street um, or, or buildings, and there's already a pretty hefty engagement process in those sort of situations. So they, they wouldn't have to come to this panel for, for that kind of thing. Um, however, we would use the same kind of naming policy criteria. So let me go forward. Um, this panel, um, the proposed membership, kind of 13 to 15 folks um, representing a broad range of perspectives and experiences. And you see kind of the, the um, range of experiences and diversity um, that we'd be looking for for the panel. And again, this is the panel that would um, twice a year um, convene and review the um, applications. So um, again, this is as of, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago when the county manager made the presentation and we looked at the feedback we've received and of course the other research we've done. And this, these are kind of the criteria we have thus far for uh, renaming. Um, and again, this would be used for naming too, same sort of set of criteria. Um, individuals who've made a, a significant contribution to Arlington or Virginia or the country, a uh, name that has a connection to Arlington, um, Arlington, Virginia, not Arlington, Texas, um, uh, references of historical significance to Arlington or the country, uh, geographically based references, um, identification or function based, um, and something that really should be in this list, it isn't used as an example, but like, you know, a natural resource, um, the, um, the, the winding brook, you know, um, building or, you know, something like that. Not that we would name something that, but you get the idea, hopefully. Um, business organization that makes um, an exceptional, exceptional financial contribution to preserve, maintain, or operate a facility. Um, and diversity um, and representation from a broad spectrum of people and something that aligns with the county's vision and values. Um, so those are you know, the draft criteria that we've um, developed thus far. Um, so I'm gonna pause for a moment. Um, I just have one more slide to kind of give you a sense of next steps. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Slatt, I, I hope we have just a few minutes. Um, if there's any feedback or thoughts people have, um, we'd love to hear them. Um, on, on the things that I have here, kind of the process, the membership of the group, um, criteria, just any other thoughts. We're in a, a you know, taking your input kind of mode and, and thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'll go ahead and open it up if any commissioners have a response or proposed feedback. It looks like Commissioner Price, go ahead, you're first. Mr. Chairman Slatt, thank you so much. I appreciate that and also I appreciate the presentation. I really just have a question as someone who's participated in the Lee Highway Alliance as a board member uh, in our efforts to rename Lee Highway. So we went through a process that uh, to, to help rename and we've actually testified and submitted a name to the county board. I'm just curious as to how the, does the current process differ from what you've just proposed? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know if I have a, a point by point comparison, but um, I, did you happen to be the one who did the presentation on the Lee Highway process? No, that was Matt Weinstein. Oh, okay, all right, it was excellent. I thought they did a very, very good job. Um, I think there are 
some similarities, um, you know, in terms of coming from the community. Um, I think the level of engagement, I think there's a fair amount of engagement that is kind of built into this. Even before, um, I didn't get into this, but even before the name um, were to come to um, the county in this panel, um, the, the hope and expectation would be there would be a fair amount of research and engagement. Um, the ability to have public comment, um, the input from a wide range of people um, as, as part of the process. I mean, those off the top of my head, those are the a uh, few of the commonalities um, that I would I'd see, would see. Mr. Chairman, just a quick follow-up. Um, and so nothing that you're proposing is, would, would that interrupt the process that we've already started? I guess my concern is that, you know, we've been moving, they, we moved forward, we moved forward very swiftly um, to get that our, our recommendations to the county board. And I don't know if that process is going to be held up by the adoption of this new process. Oh, I, I understand. I understand now. And maybe I didn't, um, I, I might not have been on track with, with my answer the first time around. I, I don't see this having any effect. Really, this is oriented toward county facilities, um, parks, streets. Um, in the case of Lee Highway, I mean, it's, it's more than just a county road. So um, this is really oriented toward um, streets, parks, facilities that are um, within the county government's purview gotcha. um, and Thank ultimately you. within the county board's ability to make a decision. I, I don't see this having a um, effect. In fact, I think in some ways um, the, the Lee Highway process may be, um, uh, oh, what's the word? Um, helped us think about this more and say, hey, let's let's develop a cons consistent process for our county roads, streets, parks, et cetera. Thank you. Th thank you for the question. Great. Commissioner Land, tell me you had your hand up next. Uh, yeah, I just was clarifying. Um, the One of the criteria does seem to mean in different words that you are contemplating the possibility of uh, selling naming rights for some county facility at some point somewhere that this will allow for. Not that you're going to, but it would allow for. Um, I, I think that's right. Um, I mean, there's a few examples, um, you know, right now the, the Boeing fields, um, you know, for example, or the, the mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm, it's the fields at Boeing or Boeing fields. Um, let's see, that's one example. And another one um, that I can think of that exists now, um, uh, the um, the baseball field in South Arlington. The name is escaping me right now. Of which university is it? Um, it's not Mary. Is it uh, um, George, uh, George, Washington. George Washington? Yes. Um, you know, might be another example of that sort of thing. So um, just kind of recognizing there's there's a few of those out there now. Uh, very good question. Thank you. Okay, and and getting back to um, Commissioner Price's question with the Lee Highway Alliance. Um, the LHA is going to be moving ahead to do a renaming for the old Lee Highway, a little okay. bit that hadn't been renamed. Uh, and I think that's actually county-owned rather than VDOT. Okay. Would this slow that down? Would the, how, would that, how would it interact with our intent to move forward on the old Lee Highway renaming? It's an excellent question that I don't have an answer for, actually. Um, I, I would, I don't know. Um, I don't think we've really you know, thought a lot about that particular example, um, but we will take note of that and, um, you know, think about that and check on that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. And then Commissioner Moradovic, you're up next. Hi. Uh, yeah, I wanted to follow up on the uh, the naming rights uh, thing. I was wondering if we have any criteria for what an exceptional contribution might be, or is that something that will be discussed uh, during the actual uh, naming uh, process? Uh, because the uh, the one concern that I have is that uh, you know, I don't want the, despite a contribution, there is a lot of uh, public sector work that goes into all of these projects, and I want that work to be uh, recognized. Uh, so that's the, uh, the the kind of concern I have. Uh, another great question. Thank, thank you all so much. I was so worried I would come and nobody would have any questions so, um, or any feedback. Um, I To answer that question, I think it would be handled as part of the review process. 
Um, I think each of those situations is probably a case by case basis. And at least with my time in the county, I haven't seen it happen. I haven't, there aren't a ton of those um, anyway, from what I've you know, seen. And maybe somebody on the um, a call right now has a lot more examples that come into my mind. But um, I think that would be part of, part of the review process. And maybe even before it gets to that part. But, you know, the the, the pre-review process or before it even comes to the, the panel, I think a lot of that um, work would have to be done. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm not seeing any other hands up. Uh, so commissioners, if you have any last, moment, last minute uh, feedback or questions for Ms. Smith. Well, seeing none, then uh, thank you very much for the presentation and the opportunity to weigh in here. And uh, hopefully this means we will have names on facilities and streets and buildings that reflect our community values going forward. Yeah. And um, uh, Mr. Slat, let me just uh, mention a couple quick things, and I swear I'll be very fast. Of um, course. Kind of in terms of next steps. Um, as I mentioned, we're collecting uh, feedback on the proposal right now through the um, Engage Arlington webpage. That started on the 16th. It'll run through the uh, 23rd. Uh, the public hearing um, or the, the county board will um, hear this item, um, we anticipate, at the January 26th meeting. And then pending adoption, um, we'd in invite community members to submit, submit their interest and then host a kickoff around the March, April timeframe. So I just wanted to kind of let, let people know what the next steps are. Sounds great. All right, H have a wonderful evening. And again, thank you all for your time and service to the county. Have a good night. You too, bye-bye. And our next item is item number three. This is the Ames Center site plan. This is both a site plan uh, and a vacation. So it's two action items. And I'll turn this over to the applicant for an overview. Hi, actually, um, this is Jane Kim in DES, and I will um, be presenting just a brief overview ahead of the applicant's presentation. Okay. Okay. Try that. Just to clean this up. Okay. Um, this is the Ames Center project um, located in Roslyn. Sorry. I usually do this in PowerPoint. I thought I'd be smart and do it in, as a PDF. And here's what's happening. Um, so this project is located at the intersection of North Nash in Fort Myer Drive. Um, I think people uh, know this corner building to be the uh, Our Lady of Exxon. Um, so the project is a, um, let me, sorry, is a, to rezone to um, CO Roslyn. The mixed use development has 740 residential units within two um, 30 and 31 story towers. So there will be retail, commercial space, um, interim hotel use and um, the existing church will be redeveloped and maintained as well as the fueling station space um, to be redevelopment and maintained. 574 parking spaces are located in both below and above grade structured parking with a um, residential parking ratio, I believe, of 0.72. There are several modifications, including the required number of parking, compact parking spaces, loading, mechanical penthouse and um, some density related um, modifications as well. Um, I just briefly wanted to run through some of the parking um, details that you uh, may not have noticed um, and to point out that there is shared parking on this site um, of a total of 45 spaces, 10 of which will be reserved for the residential visitors, 14 for retail, 21 for commercial, and then four separate spaces um, Will, of the 45 will be dedicated, or no, outside of the 45 will be dedicated to the church use. There is, I believe, some provision for um, EV parking and charging that the applicant can um, expand upon if there are any further questions. And for the loading modification, there's six spaces required and six are being provided. However, one is within a tandem um, space. 
Some of the key site plan transportation benefits include the um, building of the 18th Street corridor through the site, which is a major design element and sector plan goal. Um, there's a, a contribution to offsite transportation improvements for the area. Um, there's also, in addition to the contribution, the restriping of the North Nash Street frontage um, and street to include um, bicycle infrastructure on both sides of the street. Um, and then kind of through the construction of these projects, we'll see the skywalk removal and then further out in conjunction with the county projects to come, there will be the Fort Myer Drive improvements. And just finally, I want to touch on some future coordination items as we move through this process um, through a civil engineering plan and construction and, and even further than that. Um, so there will this will be a phased construction project with, with the buildings coming online at different times and with associated infrastructure de delivered with um, different phases. That's laid out somewhat in condition number five. Um, the proposed Nash Street bus stop is still being finalized in the design in conjunction with our transit staff. So there's condition language about that. Um, the protected bike lane buffer material, um, we heard you at the last um, TC meeting that we were here for, and we're looking into providing a more um, structured material in terms of like a curb stop or concrete barrier or something of that nature. Um, we're working with our TENO staff to get that fully designed during the CEP process. So the condition language is also there that, you know, that's still to be discussed. Of course, the skywalk removal is a big element and is covered in a site plan condition and then kind of outside of the site plan, but coming is the Fort Myer Drive changes for the future. And, um, you know, the county staff recommends the um, adoption of the ordinances. So we hope that you find the same conclusion. And I do have the plats showing the requested vacations. And if you have any questions about that, or if Linda Collier is going to maybe speak on that, I have that language up and available for when we get to that portion as well. So at this point, I will turn it over to the applicant. Great, thank you, Jane. Um, So good evening, everyone. I'm John Schick. Um, I'm with Wells and Associates um, here for the applicant this evening. We also have our whole um, team on the call here to help answer questions as they come up. Um, but we're very excited to be back here tonight. We're here, it's been a while actually, um, when we came for info. So we're here to present some of the updates. Um, and since it's been a while, we'll just kind of walk through the site um, once again. <clears throat> So just a brief overview of the project. I think, you know, Jane did a nice job outlining. It's, you know, in the core of Roslyn. It's bounded by Fort Myer on the east side um, and Nash Street on the west side. Um, the current program has, you know, is at a 10 FAR, um, includes 740 residential dwelling units, about 10,000 uh, square feet of retail, 9,500 um, square feet of commercial space, as well as the church and gas station um, that are remaining as part of the redevelopment. Uh, parking for the site, um, the, the um, garages include 574 spaces. This equates to about a 0.72 parking ratio, um, which I'll hit on a little bit later to show how that breaks down um, and show that it's actually come down since the last time we presented to everyone. Um, and also a thing to note that the above grade parking is convertible um, to residential uses in the future. <clears throat> this slide here just again overviews the existing site access and loading out there today. Um, as I mentioned, Nash Street bounds the site on the west uh, with Fort Myer on the east. Um, as you can see, there's five curb cuts today that serve the site, um, as well as four curb cuts that serve the gas station. Um, up on the north end of the site. Um, the program is shown here. Today, the site includes about 162,000 square feet of office, um, four pump islands for the gas station, and a church with um, about 450 seats. Uh, 
I think everyone on this call is very familiar um, with the abundant uh, transit resources in the Roslyn area. Um, just to remind everyone, we're right across the street from the Roslyn Metro Station here, um, as well as a plethora of bus stops, um, you know, in the Roslyn neighborhood, including one along our site frontage um, on Nash Street. In addition to all the transit options, um, there's also numerous bicycle facilities in the area. Um, as you can see, both Nash Street and Fort Myer Drive are designated for on-street routes. Um, also shown on here are the Capital Bike Share stations, uh, with the nearest one being at the corner of Wilson and Fort Myer uh, that has 30 docks. <clears throat> Here's a nice overview, I think, of the site plan. Um, it shows the two towers along with the 18th Street corridor through the middle. Um, again, the two towers will include about 740 dwelling units, 9,500 square feet um, of commercial space, as well as just over 10,000 square feet of retail. Um, just walking everyone around the site, starting on Nash Street, uh, we'll have a vehicular entrance on the south side of the site. Um, that will be the only uh, curb cut on Nash Street, so we'll have a reduction. And then over on Fort Myer, we will have our um, head in and head out loading access, which will be on the south end of the site, as well as another entry to the garage on the north end of the site. Um, and as shown here, the four um, curb cuts for the gas station are to remain with redevelopment. <clears throat> the pedestrian circulation, um, as well as the bicycle racks and future scooter crowd is shown here. Um, again, you know, we're going to have streetscape improvements all along the site. Um, one of the major things that I have a slide to hit on a little later is this corner up here and the removal of this slip lane. Um, and then, as additionally, you can see the 18th Street corridor traverses the center of the site, um, which will be a you know a great connection. Everyone coming from the west in Roslyn to be able to continue through the site. Um, to get over to the metro station. <clears throat> and then bicycle racks will be, will happen both on Nash and on Fort Myer Drive. So as I mentioned before, one of the major improvements that we're proposing is the removal of this slip lane that's out there today, going from Nash on to Fort Myer. Um, so today, vehicles coming north on Nash that want to go on to south on Fort Myer can come through this slip lane, um, and there's a yield sign. So what we're proposing is to close that slip lane, um, and this is part of the sector plan, um, and this will ultimately shorten these crossing distances, um, as shown here, as removing this uncontrolled crossing uh, that currently exists here today. So in total, you know, you'll be shaving off about 30 feet from the crossing distance across Nash um, and right around 30 feet as well on the Fort Myer crossing. So next up, we have a few renderings. Um, this is really just to showcase the, you know, the great addition that the 18th Street corridor is going to bring to Roslyn. Um, so this is on Nash Street from the 1401 property looking across, um, so looking east. And as you can see, there'll be a new crosswalk across Nash, um, and it will lead right into the 18th Street corridor, um, which will then go down stairs and then eventually down onto Fort Myer Drive. So this is the upper um, part of the plaza. And then this is looking on the other side. So now that you're down on Fort Myer Drive, um, this is showing the ultimate condition when the tunnel is filled in. Um, that will include the crosswalk across Fort Myer to get over to the Metro. Um, and then the connection to the 18th Street corridor through the AIM site. Mm -hmm. So now just to walk um, briefly around the site and show everyone the cross sections and how things are changing out here. Um, so we'll start over on Nash Street. So this is just south of that crossing that I just showed two slides ago uh, for the 18th Street corridor. So as you can see today, there's eight foot parking lanes on both sides, as well as two 15 foot travel lanes. Um, the proposed condition includes two 11 foot travel lanes. Um, it includes protected bike lanes um, 
on both sides. As Jane mentioned as well, there's still some discussions as to the material here, but what we're currently showing is a precast um, concrete buffer of three feet that would be on both sides protecting the bicyclists from the traveling. Um, and then specifically where this cross section is taken, uh, this would be where we're showing the floating bus stop um, along Nash. North and south, there's a parking lane <clears throat> on this side. So stepping over to Fort Myer Drive, this is in front of the south tower. Um, so looking northbound, again, as you can see, there's three conditions here. So the top condition shows the existing of what's out there today. The middle shows the condition of what will be out there post um, redevelopment of the AIM site. And then the third section shows the ultimate condition <clears throat> of what would be out there on Fort Myer Drive upon the tunnel being filled in. So as you can see, the major improvement here um, is enhanced streetscape that will be widened um, from you know the current 15 foot up to 18 feet, and then eventually to 20 and a half feet. Um, it will also include the cycle track eventually that will run up and down <clears throat> Fort Myer Drive, as well as the lane changes that are all shown um, in the core of Roslyn study. This section just um, steps a little bit further north. It is in front of the North Tower. Again, the three conditions existing post redevelopment of the AIM site and then the ultimate condition of Fort Myer Drive. Um, again, the major thing to highlight here is the streetscape improvements with the widened sidewalks, um, as well as the parking lane and bike lane in the interim, and then ultimately including the 10 foot cycle track, as well as the buffer. <clears throat> Just to spend a little bit of time on the parking reduction, um, we heard you know the comments last time at TC um, and some concern that the parking ratio may be slightly high. Since then, um, I think this illustration shows it best. We've removed one of the above grade levels of parking, um, and what that's done is it's reduced our parking from 650 spaces down to 574 translating to a ratio reduction of from 0.81 down to 0.72. Um, again, it reduces that mass, the podium, from five down to four levels. And then, as I mentioned previously, if the demand for car ownership decreases, um, the above grade parking is convertible to re residential uses. <clears throat> The next element I want to highlight is the loading dock. Um, I think one of the you know, best elements of this loading dock, and I'm not sure it's seen anywhere else in the county, is the fact that all loading is head in and head out uh, from this dock. So there will never be a truck backing in off of um, the public street for this project. Um, so as shown, we have the five <clears throat> loading bays, as well as this one um, staging zone within our bay that trucks can still get around if someone is um, idling and waiting to be serviced. <clears throat> and then I also want to mention that a loading management plan uh, will be provided to the town, you know, that will outline loading and service procedures. <clears throat> the final element I'm going to hit on is the um, preliminary TDM plan. Again, this is very standard across the county, so I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before. Um, but, you know, a few of the big things to hit on in the facilities improvements. You know, again, we're going to have the transportation information displays in the building lobbies. Um, we'll have, you know, plenty of bicycle parking and storage uh, to satisfy the zoning ordinance requirements. The 18th Street corridor, as I talked about, will traverse the site, you know, and be a <clears throat> major improvement for Roslyn pedestrian connections. Um, both Nash Street and Fort Myer will have major streetscape improvements. The removal of the Nash Street slip lane at Fort Myer, which will greatly reduce the crossing distances and improve that intersection overall, um, is also a major benefit of this project. <clears throat> and then finally, I mean, just to monitor this, the applicant will be responsible to submit an annual report to the county. Um, describing TDM related activities occurring at the site. <clears throat> so with that, we'll be happy to answer any questions you all may have.
Thank you very much. I appreciate that presentation. We will jump into Commissioner questions and comments. And the hand I saw first was Commissioner Lant. Actually, before we jump into those, um, I was SPRC representative for this um, development. So just a few, a little bit of background for the commission of what happened in SPRC. Um, there was a big change on Nash Street. The original Nash Street submission uh, did not sort of honor the sector plan from a bike facility standpoint, uh, but some great work was done um, as far as swapping where the parking went to make sure we can have uh, protection for those bike facilities and the resulting um, floating bus island. Uh, then there was some back and forth about whether um, this was the appropriate time to remove the um, Skywalk uh, across Fort Myer Drive. Uh, there was some talk about keeping it, but ultimately the decision was made that uh, since our end goal is to get rid of it, uh, now is the time to get rid of it, um, even though uh, it appears we're not doing a sort of an interim um, mid-block crossing there of Fort Myer. There is, I believe, to be ultimately a mid-block crossing of Fort Myer there um, once the tunnel is removed, but the tunnel makes it difficult to put one there. Um, those are the main uh, discussions I recall at SPRC along with the uh, the, the parking ratio. Um, so with that background, uh, let's jump to Commissioner Lantelmi who had his hand up first. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Slide. Um, I actually have a question for Ms. Kim. Um, and this would be at the corner of North Nash and Fort Myer Drive, where we're getting rid of the slip lane and building a, a bump out, which cuts down on the distance to cross the streets, which is great. Um, I think this all looks really good. I'm wondering whether, given that, look, and actually you can see it on the, the screen uh, on the, the uh, diagram that's up here, um, you'll see there's the... Um, striping which angles down so it sort of follows North Nash across Fort Myer Drive. Um, I'm hoping that's just really for illustrative purposes and not the actual configuration when it's done. It would strike me that it would be people are going to be walking straight across uh, Fort Myer Drive rather than angling across because the metro is in the other direction from where the angle's going. Um, and you're going to have people just going right across. Um, will we have a bump out or something matching uh, right across Fort Myer Drive so that we can shorten maybe even further? Um, we might lose maybe one parking space, but I think overall it would be better because that's where people want to go and that's the desire line uh, from going across Fort Myer Drive to where most of the pedestrians are going to be walking. Sure. Um, this is Jane Kim with DES. I think that's something that we can look into lining up that crosswalk during the um, civil engineering plan process. We need to work with our um, engineering and operations folks to see what alignment makes sense for this um, interim condition, as well as seeing if there is even any ability across the street to modify an existing um, curb. If it's in the right of way, maybe there's some opportunity to speak with the applicant to provide um, an off-site um, receiving ramp, but that will be something that we can definitely take a look at um, as we continue through the engineering process. Right, and I would say that even if it won't work for an interim condition, if it can as a permanent condition as we move further down into this project, um, let's keep that in mind too. Yes, I think that's, that's very important and a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Great, next I have Commissioner Clement's hand up. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay. Very well. All right. This plan will replace a 12-story office building and above-ground garage with two 30-story residential towers, quadrupling the density of a block in Roslyn that is already more congested than any other zip code in the county. The Transportation Commission has been asked to approve this development without the benefit of a transportation impact analysis or even a TIA executive summary. Staff evidently take on faith the report of its transportation consultant that quadrupling the density of the site will have a negligible impact on nearby intersections. According to the staff report, Wells Associates concludes that, quote, with the future redevelopment of the site, the eight signalized study intersections would continue to operate in the same manner if redevelopment did not occur on this site, end quote. Even though the Ames Center will generate 250 a.m. peak trips and 264 p.m. peak trips per day. 
The Ames Center alone will dump 574 vehicles from 740 new residential units on Roslyn streets. According to the staff report for the redeveloped Marriott site, the Marriott will dump another 623 vehicles. The Holiday Inn site directly across the street from the Marriott and down the street from the Ames Center will dump 818 vehicles housed in two garages. These three developments could easily triple the amount of traffic at Lee Highway and Fort Myer Drive, an intersection that is currently operating at LOSF. According to the TIA done for the redeveloped Marriott in 2019, the combined impacts of four existing new developments exclusive of pipeline developments at the Marriott Holiday Inn, Ames Center, Roslyn Gateway, and Roslyn Plaza was 17,664 vehicle trips per day. While it is commendable that the developer has scaled back the Ames Center parking 2.72 spaces per unit, the development itself is densification on steroids. What difference does it make if most people take transit when the streets in the nearby are impassable by car, Uber, Lyft, bus, or even e-scooter? Thank you. All righty, thank you, Commissioner Clement. Uh, Commissioner Raddick, you're up next. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions for Mr. Schick. I hope I'm saying his name right. Uh, first, you said that parking is convertible to residential uses later. I, I assume you're talking about the above grade levels, but what does that actually mean? If you could explain a bit more. I think there actually may be someone um, from the architecture team or Kedrick on the line that may be able to describe it better than I can. But yes, it is the above grade levels that are convertible to residential uses later on. So sure, I can is, uh, oh, go ahead, Tim. Sorry, this is Tim Frimmel from Snell Properties. So thanks for the question. Those, those above grade levels are built flat rather than sloping. Um, and also they are structurally engineered to accept the load of a residential commercial use rather than parking. It seems counterintuitive, but it actually has to be a heavier construction to accept residential load rather than cars. This is Andrew Taylor, also the, uh, the architect. And in addition to that, the mechanical systems and the plumbing and the utilities have the extra capacity um, built into them to be able to absorb um, that change of use as well. Okay, thank you. Um, my, one other quick question. Uh, the 18th Street, I guess, through way, whatever, whatever it will be called, um, what, what phase will that be constructed in? So again, this is Tim Freeman with Snell. Uh, you know, the phasing, we have worked with staff um, sort of proactively on the phasing. Um, if we do end up in a situation where we have to phase the project, the majority of the 18th Street corridor would be provided in the second phase. We'll provide what is possible to be provided in the first phase to provide access to the site, um, but the majority of it will be provided in the second phase. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Fessy Work, you are up next, and my apologies on that probable butchering of your last name. It's all good. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Slate. Uh, I just have two quick questions. Um, one revolves around, and this is open for Ms. Kim, I believe, or Mr. Secret, or anyone on the uh, on the team, um, regarding parking. I didn't really hear anything about like handicap parking. Uh, how many, I guess, sp uh, spaces are uh, designated for that? Um, if if you guys can, please. I guess, um, talk about that, that'd be fantastic. And the other it revolves around the um, pedestrian, the new pedestrian, uh, I guess, uh, crosswalk that uh, goes through the North and South Tower. Um, is there, uh, do you guys have any sort of information in terms of the uh, signage uh, when it comes to that or any sort of, I guess, uh, knowledge in terms of uh, I guess like a, a yield signage or uh, like a pedestrian, um, like those flashing lights or, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, 
So let me let me get to the second question first. This is Tim again with Snell. I think, are you talking about the, the crosswalks across Nash and Fort Myer Drive? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so on Nash Street, it, and Jane, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but Nash Street is not signalized. It's a it's a fairly narrow street, so there would be no no flasher, no signal, okay. just a just a painted crosswalk on Nash. Okay. Got In it. the final condition, the ultimate condition on uh, on Fort Myer Drive, mm -hmm. once the tunnel is removed, mm -hmm. I believe that there will possibly be a signal on Fort Myer Drive, but again. I think the, the county staff, when they get into the planning of the removal of the Fort Myer Drive Tunnel, mm -hmm. will get into whether that will be a signalized cross, uh, crosswalk or not. Got it. Got it. There are currently, this is Jane Kim with DS. I, I believe um, Tim is correct in that there is a uh, mid-block crossing currently in the plans for North, North Fort Myer Drive. Again, once the tunnel is removed, all of those pedestrian needs will be reevaluated. Um, it will be likely that new counts will be taken. And, you know, if the demand calls for it, if this, there's some sort of safety issue or visibility issue, mm -hmm. um, we'll of course put one in there and it, it, it is accounted for in the project scope currently. Okay. Um, on North Nash, yeah, I, I believe Tim's correct that there is nothing um, planned for there. But again, okay. once the 18th Street corridor comes in, perhaps when the um, property across Nash Street redevelops mm -hmm. and we have more people actually making that crossing, we can look at the volumes and look to see if there is some sort of uh, mid-block crossing signal that will be needed at that time. And, and you know, if if that's the case, we'll definitely look into putting one in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, those flashers are... Um, as signals go on a lower tech, generally speaking, mm -hmm. and so they are um, p potentially able to be installed um, more easily than, for instance, like a big intersection signal or yeah. something like that. So that that would be evaluated again in the future. So this project isn't the end-all be-all of mid-block crossings for this area. Sure. And, I, and then your, as to your ADA um, parking question, um, yeah. you know, the, they have to meet the zoning ordinance requirement for the number of handicapped spaces and, yeah. um, you know, my earlier review of the of the parking counts you know met that um, i'm not sure if they're exceeding that at this point but i'm sure I, I do believe they have to meet the zoning there's no modification for that so okay got it thank you fantastic uh commissioner bros you're up next uh thank you chairman slat um i i like the the changes that have been made also i um I'm happy to see that the, the parking was also reduced. Um, I, I understand uh, Commissioner Clement's concerns about the number of cars that are being added to the neighborhood. I, I live in this neighborhood, and I, uh, pre-pandemic, spent a lot of time walking around it um, and going using the metro, um, and aware of the, the, uh, the amount of cars in the rush hour. But I think most of the cars come through um, Roslyn uh, during rush hour. And my guess is the folks that um, end up living in these towers would be probably taking advantage of transportation. Um, um, and and I think you have to provide some parking for folks. So um, on the whole, I um, think that that's, that's okay. I, I like the 18th Street um, cut through as well. Just curious if you guys could talk a little bit about the grade changes and how that's managed um, from Nash Street to Fort Myer Drive. Um, and finally, um, uh, also um, like the improvements to the elimination of that slip lane, which um, there are very long, to very long walks. Um, shortening them will certainly make that a little bit safer for pedestrians. So, um, just a question, I think, around the 18th Street um, walk. Maybe we could have Rodrigo, if you're available, to talk about that. Hi, uh, yes, this is uh, Rodrigo Bell. I'm the landscape architect who's been dealing with that, that grade change. So we, we have uh, 14 feet or so grade changes we have to negotiate and then looking at very different options, um, balancing the desire to have usable spaces and uh, a direct access. What we opted to do is to create a uh, flat area, uh, two flat areas, an upper plaza and a lower plaza connected by this stair which uh, negotiates about 12 feet of that grade change. Uh, but we made the stair a very gentle stair at a 30% slope. So it's a, it's a very, it just flows straight up the hill in a very gentle way. Um, and then uh, next to the stair, you can see in the plan an elevator. So mm -hmm. that elevator is accessed from the side of the stair and it's the accessible route up through the plaza. Um, both plazas, upper and lower plaza for their full uh, space are fully accessible. Um, aside from that 
big stair in the in the center that's negotiated to the through the elevator. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Awesome. Commissioner Buck, you're up next. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll I'll put a pin in the parking issue for now. I I I, I think I, I kind of align myself uh, to a large degree with Commissioner Clement's comments. I I, I just personally I I, I think uh, there's still too much parking. I'll leave it at that. Um, I I want to talk about the 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 park and the Nash Street mid block crossing uh, again. I. I I'm glad to see that a little bit of, of refinement went into the, the mid-block crossing. Um, but I'm wondering if any consideration was given to um, one of my comments from, from the first round, which is uh, the crosswalk, it's, it's, it's a bog standard high vis mid-block crosswalk. And I, I thought I saw somewhere that there was an RRFB planned to supplement it, which is, which is fine. Um, was there any thought given to giving it any sort of, I don't know, landscape touch or something to make it look like a true connection of what is in the plan supposed to be kind of a linear feature, um, such as mimicking some of the materials in the park portion or um, considering some sort of raised you know, a raised crosswalk or something on that order. Jane, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, from from the staff side, I don't believe that there was um, that sort of discussion in terms of kind of landscaping or visually making the crosswalk more than, you know, what's being shown. Um, directly adjacent to it, though, will be a floating bus stop island, um, which will have some opportunity to soften um, that area a little bit. Um, we're still working out some of those details right now, and we'll be continuing that through the the civil process. Um, I'm not sure for you know for the engineering, my engineering colleagues, what could be done to to help kind of make that crosswalk either stand out more or blend in more with the 18th Street design. But that's something that, um, you know, we can, I can take back and, you know, we can discuss further if there is some opportunity for some of these things that you suggested, like a raised crosswalk or something like that. Um, I, I just don't know how it works with like the drainage or things like that. And um, we just have to, to see if it, number one, works engineering wise and then, Number two works with any site distance or other types of um, things that may may need to be considered. Is is there someone from is John or Steve on the line? Maybe you guys can chime in from you know the sure. applicant's perspective and and from an engineering perspective that might be helpful. Yeah, hi Jane. This is this is John Littlestansky from Bowman Consulting on the civil engineering side of things. And as far as the crosswalk goes, um, number one, sure, we, we can look at some different options, but one of our primary concerns is the drainage. So we have to be careful about not, not doing anything that's going to block any kind of drainage from happening here. And then on the choice of materials, it's always a little bit of a, of a delicate situation here, only because we have to be careful about using so the pavers that would occur, for example, in the 18th Street, um, the, the basic, you know, the plaza area. You, know, you don't want to put those exactly into the, into the middle of, the, of Nash Street just because they, they wouldn't last very long. A couple of snowplow comes along and just it trashes everything out. So you have to be very careful in the usage of the proper materials. But we could certainly look at that and see if we could take some cues, which is what I think you're talking about, just kind of visually try to connect them. And we could look at that a little bit. But I, I think, Jane, you know, my, personally, my biggest concern is like not blocking drainage. And then after that is, is the, you know, we don't want your folks on the... Uh, operation side to come back to you and say, hey, I had, you know, had, to, had to remove like five square feet of, of brick. Do you mind if I put asphalt in the middle, you know? So we got to be careful about that kind of stuff. But, but we could certainly look at that, though. Another concern would be, um, this is Steve Liam from Bowman as well, that the crosswalk is at a skew and it's not perpendicular to Nash Street. So that, that, that does become an issue with um, kind of having it in a skew angle than having it perpendicular for a raised crosswalk. Um, one quick follow-up question. Uh, I, I know you noted that the floating bus island is still in design. Um, my my concern, and, and I could assuage this by detailed look at the plans, um, 
there's not plans to put a shelter on that island that would affect visibility, is there? No, at this time, I don't believe that there's a shelter on that island. And I don't anticipate there being one. So we, we're, we're mostly working on dimensions, making sure that it's the right height for the bus and, and things of that nature. And again, working out the drainage details and and um, trying to just accommodate it along this along this kind of limited section. Um, and so those those are just the things that are still being finalized. But thank you. Awesome. Uh, I'm just going to jump in here because I, I kind of want to weigh in on Commissioner Buck's thought here about the Nash Street crosswalk. Um, I agree it would be great to make this feel like more than just a bog standard crosswalk. Um, and I feel like what really is uniting the 18th Street corridor at this point based on the designs is uh, the, you know, the landscaping and the greenness and the plantings. Um, so I know you're still settling on... Um, a buffer material for the protected bike lanes. I think this speaks uh, once again to how great some sort of uh, planter. I know they make crash rated planters and that the uh, Roslyn bid has already installed some of those in the public right of way um, with some DES support. So just want to kind of chime in again there that uh, precast curbs are great, uh, but uh, greenery, <laughs> crash rated planters with some flowers would be uh, even better. Um, I also just want to, as long as I'm talking, say I uh, pre really appreciate everybody's great work on NASH. Um, this is a huge improvement from the initial 4.1 application. Um, uh, also, I really appreciate the clarity about Fort Myer in your PowerPoint presentation as far as existing condition, interim condition, and future condition. Um, and I will say the staff report right now is not clear in, in any way, shape, or form about how that um, moves along. Um, so I appreciate the clarity in the in the PowerPoint. Um, I appreciate the parking reduction, uh, but I will concur with Commissioner uh, Clement and Commissioner Buck that uh, yeah, I would certainly support an even lower parking ratio. And it's really great to see um, some movement on realizing the 18th Street corridor. Uh, so with those comments, I will pass it to Commissioner Bruno for his first question or comment of Transportation Commission. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you for this presentation. Just uh, two brief questions. Um, and I'm actually not sure if the first one is for staff or the applicant, but can you talk a little bit about the uh, the loading zone on, on Fort Myer? I'm, I'm a little curious to, to learn more about this and specifically any safety treatments that might be included um, that could hopefully impact the uh, pedestrian and bicyclist experience. So again, Tim Freeman with Snell. The, as we mentioned in the presentation, it's head in, head out. So, you know, it's not, there will be no trucks blinding, uh, backing blinding, blind be over the sidewalk here. So there is no plan for any, you know, I don't know what you have in mind, but it, given that things are head in, head out, it seems like drivers will be able to, to accommodate bicycle, bicyclists and pedestrians on the sidewalk. Do you anticipate that this would change through each individual evolution of of the uh, project, or is this this is coming in the first phase and it'll it'll just be done? This is coming when this building is built. It is coming with the loading dock. Okay. Yeah, and and this is Jane Kim with DS, and with the future build out of Fort Myer and more or less expanding the streetscape here, the curb cut will just be included in that expansion. So it'll just be a you know longer stretch for the truck to travel through but you know we'll have for at least the cycle track i'm sure there's some sort of like signage that's put up that alerts people to the fact that there's a driveway here and when you're on a bike it's probably you know important to, to know that and so once we get to that part of fort meyer we'll we'll definitely um make sure that we have safe curb cut crossings for um cyclists okay all right that's that's very important thank you um, my, my second question switches uh, gears a little bit, and it's just maybe a, a reminder. Can you, uh, to the applicant, speak to the percentage of the square footage that is being allocated to ground floor retail? John, can you take it to the slide? 
I don't have this in percentages, but a very small amount of ground floor retail, basically two small retail bays, uh, three small retail bays really on the Fort Myer uh, drive grade. If you remember, if you understand, our site really has two front, two ground floors, Fort Myer ground floor, Nash ground floor. On the Fort Myer ground floor, we have these three retail bays that are about 10,000 feet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Commissioner Price, you're up next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, also, let me first thank all the new members who joined us. Uh, appreciate looking forward to meeting you in person one of these days. One of these days. Um, I would like to ask the applicant. I think yeah, I, there's lots to I like about this project. Everything has been stated so far. Um, one of the things I want to ask clarification on, because I really I, I had to do a double take on it, was the phrase you said, if the market doesn't bear out in terms of parking, uh, that you would consider converting some of the above grade parking is convertible to residential uses. And I'm assuming by you mean residential uses, you mean residential units too. So uses and units to me are, are, are two different things, um, which I'm, I'm glad to hear. I'd like clarification on that, but I'll, I'll continue on the thought. Um, also, I heard that there's something that you're going to report to the county on TDM measures. Um, would that potentially include a report on parking demand? And the reason why I ask that is because the Mr. Chairman, he can back me up. The level of frustration we went with the Holiday Inn down the block and the fact that they were, in our humble opinion, humble, I will say, they were so overparked, not taking advantage of the significant number of parking lots in the entire area, um, and that they were so arrogant about their parking and that they wanted their parking and they weren't going to budge on it. I'm so glad to hear that you're you're considering converting something from you know parking to a residential use. But I kind of want to know if you would consider re reporting that to the county so we could have a continued ongoing discussion about that. And I'll leave it at that. Sure. So let me answer the first part of the question about the convertible use. So we are we are currently maxed out on our FAR. So it, we're at 10 FAR with all of our um, residential commercial uh, uses. But what we have done is we know that in the future, or we believe, we all believe that in the future, people are going to drive less potentially, and there'll be less demand for vehicles. So rather than designing space parking space above grade that in the future could not be converted into something more useful. We've taken this, the approach to say, look, we don't know what's gonna happen in the future, but we think we're going this way. And to the extent it goes this way, we have the ability to, to transform this space into something more useful than a parking deck. So at that point, we would have to come back to the county for a site plan amendment and say, hey, you know, we don't need, we don't need all this parking space anymore. Can we please convert it into something other than parking? A quick follow up, but you can again consider including the parking demand information in your report on TDM. So I'll leave that question to Wells. Yeah, so on the TDM side, and Jane can certainly jump in here. So the county monitors um, each site uh, for TDM, and the applicant you know, makes a contribution to fund. You know those reports to be generated, but I believe at the county's discretion they have you know numerous measures they can evaluate whether it's peak hour trips, parking occupancy, um, that type of thing. Yeah, our um, TDM team does look at the um, parking utilization through these um, reviews, and so that information and data um, will likely be gathered through that process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just throw in Commissioner Price that those graphs that we have seen in the past as far as like um, the price of parking at your desk at your work, it has the biggest impact on, um, you know, whether you own a car versus the price of parking at your building. Uh, those are all the result of these TDM site plan studies, um, which means that they are looking at parking demand and parking pricing and that sort of thing. So. It is uh, already baked in to some extent there. Yeah, just don't ask the Holiday Inn that because we'll <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see if a Holiday Inn gets built in this financial environment anytime soon. <laughs> 
Uh, Commissioner Muratovic, back to you. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, so uh, Commissioner Clement has already touched up on densification and uh, given the increase in densification, not just on uh, this site, but the surrounding sites, it will become uh, more and more important to uh, prioritize pedestrians. And so there are a lot of positives already with this project, uh, such as expanding the, uh, the sidewalks and the 18th Street uh, cut through. And uh, what I would like to know is, would it be possible to build up on these uh, pre-existing strengths with something as simple as the continuous sidewalks instead of uh, traditional curb cuts that might be more appropriate for like a drive through, I don't know, in Southern Virginia, rather than uh, such, an urb uh, such a uh, dense urban setting. And um, so uh, that's it. Maybe it might not be appropriate for the trucks going in. It might complicate it, but there's other several uh, curb cuts where a continuous sidewalk might be a good option. And uh, so I'd like if somebody could comment on that, that would be great. Thank you. Maybe somebody from Bowman. Sure. This is John Lutostansky from Bowman. And essentially what you're talking about is a continuous sidewalk that um, you'd have a driveway apron at the street and then the sidewalk is raised six inches versus having side curbs on both sides. That's exactly what the plan Correct. is here. Oh, perfect, we're, all right. We're anticipating that already just because it, it, it just cuts down in the conflicts between vehicles and pen peds then. All right, I apologize for not doing my homework. It, no, 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 it, it, yeah, it, it wasn't clear, you. but in the final engineering plan, it will become very apparent. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we do that pretty much every curb cut for every development that's not an actual street street in Arlington County. I haven't seen a non-continuous sidewalk style uh, uh, driveway apron in a good long time. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Buck, you're up next. Yeah, we need to we need to do it more for some street street intersections. Um, so uh, building on on uh, Commissioner Price's good parking rant, which I. I I think I'd kind of align myself with as well. Um, you know, we know the TDM program, they are they are collecting lots of great information on, on parking <laughs> occupancy. And uh, we're not we're not seeing it in the intel for these site plans that are coming up. Um, and now we're faced with a, a second big site plan for, for this area where the proposed parking is just it, it, it's an order of magnitude higher than than what the Roslyn plan allows to go down to, um, and there, it just seems like a there's a there's a mismatch between the plan and and the perception of of the market, and there is a we don't have a lot of good actionable information on what what the true current demand is and thus where we should be shooting to to outperform um so i am wondering i I'll, I'll leave that as sort of a rhetorical question of why is why is the market so far disconnected from from what the plan aspirations are parking wise um and then a, a more direct question of can we um can we within the site plan conditions think about a much more targeted um, provision of parking occupancy data after full occupancy of this building, because we want to answer a very specific question about this building: is those two, those two above ground levels? You know, I think I think everybody is best served if if those two above ground levels, if they're going to be built get built as houses rather than than parking. And I, I'd love to see the data as soon as possible so that whether or not the applicant wants to submit a site plan amendment to, to build those out as housing, I, I, I think we'd sure be all better informed if we had a good cohesive look at um, whether they can be at some point after full build out. Just checking, Commissioner Buck. Uh, I believe there was no distinct question in there, uh, but can you confirm <laughs> that before no before nobody answers it? <laughs> well, I, I guess I, to the applicants, I'd say why why is can you characterize why you know your financing and your projections and everything about this area are are so out of whack with the plan, just like 
this uh, a previous applicant was why why is why is the market saying that there should be three times as much parking as as the plan would would say and and for the county uh, for Ms. Kim I, I guess I would say we're, we're just not seeing you know we're not seeing real parking occupancy reporting as part of these these site plan applications and we're not seeing it fed back from the CDM program other than sort of at a summary level and I'm wondering if we can consider uh, some sort of site plan condition to get a, a a very targeted look at parking occupancy for this building as a condition of the site plan. So, um, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Jane. <laughs> sure. Well, first of all, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, the sector plan and, you know, our parking guidance kind of as a whole for residential projects is, and well, quite frankly, all projects is to provide um, minimums right? Not maximums. And so I think that's number one, kind of a policy thing. I think that if there is, you know, commission support for that, I think that there is generally staff support for that type of discussion to be had. Um, I doubt that countywide that appetite is there. I think um, Commissioner Slack can probably weigh in on that, as, as I'm sure he's been a part of those discussions over the many years and many um, working groups and task forces and all sorts of things like that have looked at that. Um, but that is something that we as staff um, see and have to contend with, that we only provide minimums and we have a zoning ordinance. And a lot of times these site plans come in with the modification for a parking and we as staff, you know, overwhelmingly support a reduction in parking, especially in these um, highly urban areas within Arlington. So I think, you know, we're on the same page as, as you are, um, Mr. Buck. I think the market side of things, I know that's a question for the applicant. Um, and then kind of going forward, um, your question about incorporating some sort of parking evaluation condition maybe is what you're getting at to maybe looking at those two levels levels of the garage that they currently have planned for parking and having some sort of site plan condition trigger maybe um the question there is the density issue like they can't actually build more residential units in these buildings with the current state of things <laughs> so unless there's some sort of um you know I think what they're doing is they're they're hedging their bets that in the future there will be some ability to add more density on this site, and at that point, if their parking demand um, allows for it, then they can then convert. Um, and Tim, please correct me if I'm wrong there. That's exactly right. And then can the applicant talk a bit about um, their view of the market and why this is the right parking ratio for this market in this building? Absolutely. I think, Commissioner Buck, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that there is a disconnect between the plan and what market actually is. Uh, and we, we spent a lot of time on this, uh, both internally and then also through um, this PRC process. Um, and I think Kedrick has available here, I hope, um, some of the information that we found. We we went out to the market and we did a study on, on buildings in the neighborhood and looked at what the actual utilization is in these garages uh, and what market is, uh, you know, how many cars are actually in garages in similar type of projects. And we are at or below that number. Um, so we, like we've mentioned earlier in this presentation, we came into this process with what we thought going into it we could live with from a marketing, you know, a marketable standpoint in terms of the number of parking spaces. We got beat up at SPRC. Um, we we went back. We really we did a lot of research and we squeezed down to what we think is the bare minimum market today for parking. And like Jane said, we're hedging our bets because you know, we don't want dark space any more than anybody else wants dark space 30 years from now. And so that's why we've designed these above grade levels to be convertible if the market changes. So here's the data. Uh, you know, I don't know if you want to go through this. We can provide it. Yeah, but these are these are approved parking ratios. These don't speak to what's actually being utilized, right? Like occupancy. I guess we don't have that. We do have that information. That's the information I thought we had here, but we don't. I, we can provide that. 
that would be super useful going forward. Um, though I'm certainly not going to let it uh, hold up <laughs> uh, approval on this project and everything. I really appreciate it. Um, Commissioner Buck, did you want to chime back in on any of this, or can I move to the next commissioner? No, just echo your point. It's it's you know using comps of what's been approved is 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 really um, it, it's sort of secondary to knowing exactly how much of that is actually getting used. Agreed. I, and sorry, I thought when I was talking to Kedrick earlier, I thought that's what we had, but that we do have some of that information. And to the extent we do, we can provide it. It's all good. And I will, I will, I will certainly say that it has been my experience that um, if you build it, they will come. That uh, a lot of parking demand uh, expands to fill the parking supply available um, because, you know, what you tend to do is nobody wants a bunch of empty parking spaces sitting around. So you just drop the right rate that you charge for your parking until it's full. Um, so I'm not sure occupancy tells us a, a huge, vast amount about what uh, what the demand is at a reasonable price for, for a monthly parking space. But anyway, uh, Commissioner Land, tell me, you're up next. Uh, yeah, I just want to do a touch base on the parking also. Um, I was at the SBRC also, and one of the reasons I was comfortable with the parking ratio here was, in fact, because one, they did drop it, but also because they have that convertible space, which is something I have been advocating for quite a while now um, and seeing it in a project is something that I, I'm very much attracted to. Um, and yeah, yes, yeah, right now they could not use it that way because of the density limitations, but you know, laws change and the building is in existence. Um, the need for space, who knows what could happen when, when the market turns. Um, what we could always do is have the same number of units, just make larger ones, combining units and add these other ones. Anyway. Uh, that being said, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with it going forward um, as it is now because of those those features. Though I will note, up the hill at Courthouse, uh, a project that is in site plan right now has, I think, a 0.39 ratio uh, for a residential um, re residential and retail uh, project, which is very similar to this in that it's right across the short street from the metro, metro station entrance. Um, the... Changing topics totally to the 18th Street corridor. A uh, couple things I want to um, touch on is um, you have an elevator there, of course, for ADA access to deal with the uh, topographical change there. Um, is there any non-mechanical way for someone who is otherwise handicapped to be able to make it down there, uh, avoiding the steps? Or is, because I assume then that elevator will have to be 24 seven and be well-maintained in order for it to work. The second question is for bicycles along the 18th Street corridor, the, yeah, that corridor there. Will there, will you remember to have along the stairway a, a, a runnel for uh, bicycle wheels to roll your bike up and down while you're walking the steps? Thank you. Rodrigo, could you yeah, take Yeah, I, I, I can jump on that. Um, for the last question, yes, there is a runnel uh, in the stair. It's actually shown there on the on the plan. You can sort of see the line to the right of the center of the stair. Uh, so we are providing the runnel um, and can work with uh, you know you and staff on on the exact detail of the runnel. But that that is there. Uh, and no, currently uh, to go directly through the space between the buildings, there is no. Uh, alternate route to the elevator that does not include the stairs. Uh, we looked at that option, but the amount of ramping uh, required was uh, so great that it really did not seem uh, practical um, and, and ate up a lot of this uh, uh, additional space that could be used by the public. I would just add to that that we, we met several times with Rosemary Ciotti on this uh, exact issue. Um, and explained uh, just what Rodrigo mentioned, that the ramping required to have uh, the entirety of the 18th Street corridor be accessible uh, to persons with mobility challenges would eat up the majority of it. However, with the exception of this elevator, Commissioner Land tell me the remainder of the 18th Street corridor is accessible, which is something that, that we worked hard on, hard on and are very proud of. Okay, thank you very much. All right, that is all the hands that I see. Um, so if other commissioners have questions or comments, now would be a great time to get into it. Um, I also had a quick question. I know it 
last I had heard slash seen, there was some, I believe the only outstanding issue of true disagreement between staff and the applicant was related to an elevator overrun or access to the penthouse or something like that. Has that been resolved or is that still a point of uh, disagreement between the applicant and staff? It's still a point of disagreement right now. All right. Well, as a transportation commissioner, I have uh, no opinion on it whatsoever. Um, so I would uh, suggest to the commission that we, uh, if, if that remains the way the commission feels, not particularly having an opinion about elevator access to the top floor of the building, um, that we make that clear in our um, letter to the board that we're not taking a stance on it. We just, that's not a TC issue, I would say. Uh, commissioner Muratovic. Yeah, uh, uh, this is more of a comment than a question, but if anybody else has any insights on that, I'd appreciate it. Regarding the parking usage data, uh, Commissioner Sai already touched on basically the concept of induced demand and lowering prices to fill up uh, a parking spot and why that uh, data, although, you know, I'd, I'd certainly be curious to see it, uh, why it might not be uh, useful, but also in a way it's kind of, uh, kind of the mistake that uh, many uh, generals have made in preparing for the previous war uh, in that you're using this data at this current time, but the uh, we have so many other developments coming online and uh, transportation projects and, uh, and the way people move around might be a little bit different uh, several years from now. Um, so uh, just to, that's my comment, kind of uh, bring kind of, well, th w questioning the validity of even uh, parking usage uh, data for uh, even determining this process, which I know kind of sounds insane because if you don't use that, what kind of data are you going to use? But there. Thank you, Commissioner Radovic. Uh, and then a question for staff. Uh, I would love for the commission to kind of deal with both this site plan and the vacations required to achieve this site plan at the same time. Um, so is there a separate additional presentation on the necessary vacations or, or no? Um, this is Linda Collier from the Real Estate Bureau. The Jane already put up the plat that um, shows it's basically street and utilities easements that are along the um, perimeter and just small portions that are along the perimeter. And then um, two walkway easements that go through the site, which actually terminate when the buildings come down anyway, but out of an abundance of caution, we are gonna go ahead and vacate those as well. And um, that's, all that's involved and so the you know it's up to the we would ask the transportation commission to um make a finding that those vacations are in accord with the comprehensive plan or the applicable portion thereof which would be the master transportation plan in this instance great thank you and i assume those walkway easements were in some way related to the to the public accessibility of the skywalk couldn't someone speak to that yeah, I'm not sure about that. They go through the garage, I believe, um, levels of the garage in the existing buildings. But um, Kedrick, do you know if it, it probably did have something to do with that, I would guess. I don't know, but my, my only knowledge of it is, Linda, as you said, it's, it's something in the garage. So I'm not sure that it would connect up, but it's just <laughs> really not interesting to tell you that, nor will it be used. Well, actually, that's right. Uh, but Linda, you were correct. This is John, once again, from Bowman. Uh, you're, you're correct, Linda. It's through the garage, basically. It sort of gave rights from one part to the next, you know, to go through the garage. When the buildings come down, they're no longer needed, and there'll be public sidewalks to be used. Great. Thank you so much. Um, now, would anyone else like to make a motion, or is this on me, like usual? Okay. All right, hearing nobody jump to it. Uh, I move that the Transportation Commission recommend that the County Board approve the uh, site plan amendment number, an amendment to site plan number one. Wow, I hadn't realized that. Um, for a new 740 unit multifamily residential development consisting of two building towers and the uh, associated rezoning and move that the Transportation Commission find that the uh, vacations 
as outlined in our draft board report, are consistent with the comprehensive plan, specifically the master transportation plan, and specifically that the Transportation Commission uh, makes no uh, finding or determination about the appropriateness or not of the applicant's elevator of the building reaching the top floor. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion on the floor. It has been seconded. Is there any discussion of this motion? All right, hearing, oh, Commissioner Clement, go for it. Well, okay, so in order to make an informed decision um, about this plan, uh, specifically whether or not it, it is consistent with our master transportation plan, we need to know the impacts the traffic impacts of this development on the Roslyn Street system. And we also need to know the cumulative impacts of all the developments in the nearby. And we currently do not know those impacts. Uh, the last time a, a traffic impact analysis was presented, and I believe that was for the, uh, for the Holiday Inn, or no, 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 for the Marriott, uh, it was stated that they, the actual cumulative impacts could not be determined because three uh, site plans st still in the pipeline um, have not been completed. So we don't, and we legally presumably cannot evaluate site plans that are still in the pipeline, something like that. So basically we cannot make an informed decision about one critical aspect of this development, and that is its traffic impacts. So in a situation like that, even though I appreciate the, the modifications uh, that the uh, applicant has made to this plan and to his sensitivity to uh, feedback that he has gotten from the public, unlike, of course, the Holiday Inn people, uh, nevertheless, I believe that I simply do not have sufficient information to make an, an informed decision about this plan, and therefore I plan to abstain. Thank if you. I could just jump in real quick, uh, Commissioner Slat. I mean, a traffic study was performed for this site and submitted um, along with the 4.1 application. Um, and just to speak to, you know, what was included in that study, it did include you know, everything that's currently in the pipeline out there um, right now, including, you know, the Holiday Inn, the Marriott, um, you know, et cetera. So I'm not sure how materials typically get distributed, but I mean, a traffic study was done for the site and was submitted um, and approved by DES staff. Well, I, I, I'm certainly willing to believe that. I didn't get it. I visited the website several times looking for it. But, but also, I have serious other concerns because we know for a fact that there are two sites, the Roslyn uh, Gateway and um, Roslyn Plaza, uh, the impacts of which have never been evaluated and um, because they are still in the pipeline. So they're in the immediate nearby. Uh, they're within, what, two blocks at most? Um, so I don't see how... I mean, forget about me. I don't see how staff can make informed decisions uh, about these site plans absent that type of information. Based on that, uh, Ms. Kim, can you speak to how the um, MMTIA, which I see you've uh, helpfully uh, included in the chat, a link to that. Um, can you speak to how we account for approved but unbuilt development uh, when we are uh, doing a traffic Im a transportation impact analysis for a new site? Sure. Um, usually the, there is a um, future year that um, we will look at which takes into account approved but not yet built um, projects. And, and those... Um, those counts are incorporated into the analysis that the um, consultant provides to the county. Um, those years even, and John, please um, correct me if I'm wrong, but those years, those future year, da those dates and what projects to include are all discussed during the scoping of these, of these um, studies with our engineering and operations staff so that it can be 
inclusive of everything that we do know at that point, you know, of what's coming. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're comfortable with the with what was included in the MMTA. Our TE and O staff reviews it and, um, you know, lets us know if they, they see any red flags um, with the analysis that's been done. Um, and, you know, for this project that th there were none, we didn't um, receive any feedback from, you know, my colleagues saying that, um, that there were any issues with the assumptions that were made and the considerations that were made in the study. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Uh, let me jump back to my participant list to see if anybody else has raised their hand. Um, I'm not seeing anybody, so if anybody else has any more um, discussion or comments on the motion as moved. I don't see any, so we will go to a vote wherein we will discover inevitably that I've missed a commission member when making my list for the vote, but oh well. Um, so we will start uh, voting on the motion with Commissioner Clement. Okay, so I abstain. Uh, abstention, all right. Commissioner Muradovic. This is my uh, first was so uh, what I, I mean. I support the motion. Uh, well, I, I mean, so that I, would I be the project, you can say, say yay or yes. Yes, <laughs> if you are in support. Otherwise, no or nay. Uh, Commissioner Raddick. Aye. Commissioner Buck. Uh, aye. Commissioner Bruno. Yes. Commissioner Lantelmi. Aye. Commissioner Fessewerk. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Bros. Aye. And I also vote yes. Did I miss any commissioners? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Price, there we go. I knew I was missing somebody in the list. Anybody else? All right, so that motion passes, and that included both the uh, main motion of the approval of the site plan and the finding about the uh, appropriateness of the vacations. So I believe that is the end of that item. I thank the applicant and staff for excellent presentations, and I thank the commission for a great set of questions. Bravo, everybody. All right, thank you. Have a good night. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. The next item is item number four. This is the NVTA I-395-295 commuter choice applications. Rich Roisman is here from DES staff. Good evening and happy new year, commissioners. Um, I do not have a PowerPoint presentation. I would direct the commissioners to the draft staff report to the board that Mr. Best distributed in advance of the meeting. Um, and just a quick correction, this is NVTC applications rather than NVTA. Again, so many NV things going on. Um, let me just quickly go through the staff report and discuss the two applications that we are recommending for approval this evening. And then before uh, taking commissioner's questions, I will touch on the uh, other applications that you heard about back in the December meeting that we are not carrying forward and give a brief explanation as to why that is the case. Um, we are seeking approval for two applications to NBTC for the I-395, I-95 commuter choice uh, round two. Again, these are funds that will kick in for fiscal 22 and 23. The two proposed applications are number one, and these are in ranked order as required by commission by the commission and the program. First one is an enhanced TDM program with regional van pool incentive at $2.043 million. This is for 24 months, two years of TDM program work in the corridor uh, with a target of forming 100 van pools and at least 500 new riders in the corridor through the van pool formation and uh, transit benefits and carpool benefits. Um, the as, as reviewing it again, it is not entirely clear in the staff report, and I'm going to have to tighten this up, but this is a partnership with PRTC. So the county ACCS will be responsible for the marketing and outreach and communications components to form, get the van pools formed. Um, we are, will be in partnership with PRTC through their existing van pool alliance program. PRTC will handle... Uh, after the formation, the uh, working with the Van Pool providers for 
uh, acquisition of vehicles, as well as all of the tracking mechanisms and the reporting to the National Transit Database. So um, looking at three different audiences, uh, again, by requirement of the Commuter Choice Program, these need to be targeted to the 395 and 95 Express Lane Corridor. So we're looking at business in the, biz, businesses in the urban core to capture opportunities for commuters destined for Arlington, Alexandria, Springfield, and Fairfax County in Washington, D.C., um, as well as general commuters that go across the corridor and focusing on commercial building clusters with tenants that add up to over 250 employees. Um, and there's a little bit more discussion about you know the, the mechanics of the marketing and communications piece. Uh, but that is the first priority for this round of applications. The second project and priority number two uh, is applying for continuation of funds uh, with a potential small interruption for continuing operations of the commuter store located at the Pentagon Reservation, and that is uh, just over $217,000. Keeping in mind that the minimum program request to commuter choice is $200,000, so we're coming in just above that minimum. Uh, and again, this would provide uh, additional funds to continue the operations of the commuter store at the Pentagon, um, which has been going on for some time. We uh, obviously volumes have been down significantly due to COVID, but we have been able to keep the store running through uh, pretty much by the end of this month that will be exhausted. Um, there will need to be bridge funding from other sources if the store, the permanent store is to remain open between now and July 1, although I have heard from ACCS that it will be possible in the event that that bridge funding does not come through to maintain some level of support by deploying one of our movable commuter stores to the Pentagon Reservation until a decision is made on this grant application. Um, turning to the three other projects that were brought forth in December as an information item, um, those were the uh, four mile run trail improvement in South Arlington at the South Glebe Road Bridge over Long Branch between South Troy and South Mead Street. Um, this would have reconfigured the roadway to uh, widen the trail and potentially shift or reduce uh, or eliminate some of the on street parking, which is on the north side of the bridge. Um, commissioners commented at that time, and we ultimately agreed with them and heard the same thing from NVTC, that the nature of the improvement was fairly small and would have difficulty finding a nexus with providing benefits to toll payers uh, who use I-395 in that area. Um, so while we still like the project, it is not really appropriate for commuter choice, and we'll need to fund it using other sources. Um, the second of those three projects that are not moving forward is the Army-Navy Drive Transit Center. This would have been uh, a project with WMATA, um, building a uh, multi-bay, multi-bus bay improvement near the uh, north of Army-Navy Drive between Joyce and Hayes. Um, the operating environment for both WMATA and transit in general is not favorable for pursuing a large capital project of this nature at this time. So we are proposing to look at it again two years from now when there's another call for projects and reevaluate it at this time. Um, finally, and this is a little bit disappointing because I know the commission was excited about this project for this cycle. Uh, the remaining project was improvements to the George South George Mason Drive bus lanes from the county line with Fairfax County and Arlington County um, up as potentially as far as Columbia Pike, potentially going forward to Arlington Boulevard. Um, after talking about this internally and talking with some of our other regional partners, we decided that a little bit more planning would turn this into a stronger project to compete better two years from now. Specifically, it'll give us time to coordinate directly with Fairfax County DOT, who has expressed an interest in further extending the bike lanes into Fairfax County, stopping at Seminary Road, um, and may even give us the opportunity to also talk with Alexandria um, about a further extension at that point. So. Uh, that planning work, as well as a little bit more, you know, internally within Arlington County about what the type of improvement would be, where it would be located, and things like that, uh, we think is going to provide a stronger project to go back two years from now when there's another call for projects. So we are not going to pursue it at this time, but we will be hopefully doing planning work in the interim to strengthen the application. Um, with that, I'm happy to take any additional questions from commissioners and hopefully for the, the new Three new commissioners who were not here during the December meeting. If you need additional background on the program uh, that's not contained within the draft staff report, I'm happy to provide that as needed. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, first off, I just want to thank staff again for um, this has been a huge improvement in how we move forward with these grant applications uh, coming early with potential projects, giving us the opportunity to provide feedback um, and then coming for an actual action um, has just, I, I feel, made this far more productive from a, from our perspective on the commission um, and uh, headed off a lot of those questions about like, well, what did you consider but didn't put in and why and all of that. So um, thanks again for that. I think it's a huge improvement, and I hope it will continue uh, in the future. Certainly. It's been, it's been beneficial for staff as well. Fantastic. Um, I'm not seeing any hands from commissioners uh, with questions, oh, but now I'm seeing – no, okay. It's just Commissioner Price throwing all sorts of weird stuff in the chat. Thanks so much. Uh, no, Commissioner Lantel, tell me has his hand up. Go I, ahead. Yeah. Um, this is more of a, I guess, satisfy my curiosity, but for the van pools, um, I seem to recall for years seeing the van pool signs along the road and actually seeing the van pools when I was working downtown um, and seeing the vans. They seem to have disappeared, so are we trying to revitalize or reestablish the program? What happened to it? How did it sort of just evaporate? Or am I wrong that it's always been there and robust? Uh, I can't speak to what the current volumes of van pools in the corridor are at this time. Uh, you know, obviously there's probably reduced activity due to COVID and, you know, a lot less travel demand going to some of those downtown destinations. Um, but I, I don't get the sense that this is a, a, a reboot necessarily. This is building on whatever existing infrastructure is out there. So, and I know that PRTC has been fairly successful in their, their generation of, uh, of van pools. The, the one thing I will point out that we are seeing is the uh, the olden days of the 15 passenger vans going downtown are, is, is no longer the case. You may simply be seeing smaller vehicles are really looking at uh, you know a max occupancy of about a 10 passenger van in these cases. So you may be seeing vans but not realizing that they're van pools just based on the sheer size of the vehicle. So that could explain it. Thank you very much, and I, I do support it. <laughs> so this is more to for my own personal satisfaction. Thank you. Awesome. Commissioner Fesselberg, you're up next. You're muted, Commissioner Fesselberg. Sorry, my laptop is acting up, but I appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to ask if I can get like the uh, the background for for all the uh, for the proposals and everything. Um, as uh, when you said that you were able to do so, I just just like that. That's all. That's all. Sure. Uh, the the short version is um, the commuter choice. There are two commuter choice programs: one for I sixty six and one for I three ninety five ninety five. Mm -hmm. They have some minor differences in between them, but the basic structure of them is intended to take a portion of the tolls that are paid on both those express tolling facilities and set them aside for uh, transit and non-motorized improvements in the corridor. Um, in the case of 395-95, the payments flow from the concessionaire for the facility Transurban to the state and then to NVTC, the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission and the Potomac and Rappahannock Transportation Commission, PRTC, because this covers a, a corridor that stretches from the 14th Street Bridge down into Stafford and Spotsylvania County. So, um, mm -hmm. but those two agencies jointly administer the program through a grant application process. This is the second round of a two-year round uh, for this particular program. So, so my, my follow-up is based off of it, it being the second round, what's the biggest challenge in which is currently being experienced? When it comes to um, from from my standpoint, the biggest challenge with these programs is they are uh, structured in a way that uh, having success in TDM programs is proving challenging. Mm -hmm. the The most successful applications for the program so far, and this is both sixty six and uh, I three ninety five ninety five, have been for enhanced bus service. Mm -hmm. um, However, in the case of this, and this is something that we've sort of touched on internally, and there is, I fear, going to be a little bit of sticker shock at the size of the request for this, but we're looking at $2 million in, in operating funds to do you know, TDM planning and programming to produce 500 new riders. And, and the key to this is the, the key metric that is used to evaluate this is uh, increases in person throughput along the corridor. So for $2 million in investment, we are getting 500 new riders. 
to do comparable person throughput if you were running a new commuter bus on there is going to run you significantly more money if you factor in the cost of the vehicles as uh, acquiring the vehicles as well as the operating cost of the bus. So there's big bang for the buck in van pools as, uh, as our TDM folks like to say. So fair enough. Thank you. I appreciate it. Certainly. Commissioner Buck, to you. <clears throat> Commissioner Buck, we're not hearing you, so I don't know if you're muted or what. Talking to myself. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you again for the, the pre-brief on the projects and, and then the update on, on which ones fell by the wayside for your really good explanations. Um, and uh, I just wanted to re-up uh, something that I, I know you noted in the, in the last meeting and provided a really good explanation for, which is uh, just that uh, because this is, this is kind of uh, non, uh, is money with no strings, it, it, it it provides a good opportunity to fund local bus operations if there's an opportunity there and, and understanding there is no good opportunity there this cycle. But I uh, would just love to, uh, in the next two-year cycle, hopefully there is something, hopefully the environment is there to, to at least look at, at contributing to our local bus operation and increasing headways with, with this somewhat magical pot of money for that purpose. Agreed. And we, when when we initially formulated the TDM plan, I think this was reflected in you know the description at the December meeting. In addition to the van pool or separate from the van pool incentives, we had considered doing a transit fare buyback on you know local bus routes that were serving uh, key employment destinations within the corridor within Arlington County. Um, that's that's not the route that ACCS wanted to go. They felt there was better penetration with uh, the van pool incentive. We checked again internally with our transit folks about interest in a fare buyback. And again, at this point, there was no interest. And in, quite frankly, given given the challenge of restoring, you know, lost ridership due to COVID, I don't blame them, but it's something that we will, you know, examine again when we go through the next cycle. And hopefully at that point it will be a true enhancement of service rather than having the buyback fares to reattract riders. So Fantastic. Thanks so much. All right. Sure. Uh, any other commissioner questions or comments at this time? Seeing none, I move that the Transportation Commission recommend that the County Board approve the uh, resolution authorizing submittal of two grant applications to NBTC and PRTC for the I-395, I-95 Commuter Choice Round 2 program, as outlined in our draft board report dated January 23rd, 2021. Second. Great. There is a motion on the table, and it has been seconded. Um, is there any discussion on this motion? All right. Seeing no hands raised, uh, we can move to the vote. Uh, Commissioner Clement. Yes. Commissioner Moradovic. Um, yes. Commissioner Bruno. Yes. Commissioner Buck. Yes. Commissioner Raddick. Aye. Commissioner Lantelmi. Aye. Commissioner Kessler. Commissioner Aye. Fessler. Oh, thank you. thank you. Got that as a yes. I will vote yes. Commissioner Bros. Yes. And Commissioner Price. Aye. All right, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. Reisman. Thank you. Have a good evening. You also. Thank you. I'm fighting with my camera. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Our next item, item five, parklets, has been removed from the agenda. I found that out uh, about a half an hour ago. So uh, another one down. <laughs> item. Item six, other, uh, things are really fast paced around here. <laughs> uh, I don't know what to say, but item six under other business, our next meeting will be February 4th. And I have mapped out the rest of the year for the commission and I'll get this to everyone uh, probably tomorrow. Um, our meetings are generally the Thursday before the Monday planning commission. And there is one exception, of course, and that is uh, Thanksgiving. 
we don't want to meet on Thanksgiving. Or maybe remotely, we do want to meet on Thanksgiving, but we always do that meeting on a Monday. So I'll get this out um, tomorrow, and you can just mark down that our next meeting is February 4th, and you'll get an agenda and materials as usual in advance. And that's all that staff had. Great. Uh, I did want to add, uh, Commissioner Price has something to jump in on. Awesome. But uh, first, I wanted to say um, site plan review is moving forward for the RCA building in Roslyn. Um, uh, I believe a public uh, engagement thing kicked off today, um, and SPRC will be coming up in a week or two. Um, I've done a lot of Roslyn development. I'm happy to take this one, but I would also be happy for some other commissioner who wants to uh, get involved in site plan review to take it on. So if that's something you're interested in doing or something you're interested in exploring, if you have questions, um, don't hesitate to shoot me an email um, and I'm happy to talk you through it. Um, it should be uh, should be an interesting one. And uh, Commissioner Price, I saw you had your hand up. Did you have something you wanted to say? I just wanted to ask Mr. Best that I, I really appreciate the calendar invitation, you know, emails that he sends out sort of lets me save the date, save the, the link for the meeting because I've had trouble with other meetings trying to find uh, how to log on. So Mr. Best, thank you. And if you could continue that, the recurring meeting invitations, that would be very helpful. That, that, that is the easiest way to do it and really guarantees, or I'll put this way, there's no guarantees in teams. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty self-assured you will receive it. Um, and if you don't, uh, just let me know. But no, that's that's the goal for the future, just to send Thank you. you. Fantastic. And I see Commissioner Lantel me has his hand up. Yeah, I'd like to just follow up to, to uh, Chairman Flatt um, and just highlighting a couple of things. Um, the Clarendon Sector Plan LRPC has an online engagement that's open right now, and I think it closes tomorrow. So if any of you want to weigh on, in on that, please do feel free. Um, it's open to all. Uh, another thing that um, Chairman Flatt and I are trying to do is get together a um, – a working meeting of the Planning Commission, which will be joint with the Transportation Commission, uh, to get further information from staff on the residential parking program, a permit parking program. Um, it hasn't been arranged yet, uh, but we're trying to get that done before our next meeting. So just be aware that would be a whoever wants to attend can attend. It's not an action item. It is for information only. And if you wish to attend, you can. It will be publicly noticed, of course, once we get it scheduled. And I have a meeting tomorrow with Ms. Johnson to uh, iron out the details for that. Oh, great. So Thank start, you, Mr. Best. We're starting to think about that, and we're going to have something sometime tomorrow planned to map it out. Great. Thank you. Awesome. And I did want to, I was going to jump into that, but it's great for <laughs> Commissioner Lynn tell me to, uh, to uh, jump in on that first. I did want to say two things. One is, um, I would encourage you all, um, if you have the opportunity, to go back and watch the recording of the December County Board meeting where RPP was, um, where the request to advertise was discussed. There was a lot of public feedback about RPP in that meeting, um, and it would be, uh, I think, I believe is uh, kind of our duty and in our best interest as a commission to understand that feedback um, as we prepare to eventually take a, kind of a, make a final recommendation to the board about RPP. Um, you know, because we didn't have any public feedback at the Transportation Commission meeting for RTA, but the board heard an earful. Um, so it's it's very useful to, to kind of hear uh, what the community is saying about the RPP proposal. Um, and then I also wanted to say, um, I think we all um, should be particularly impressed and astounded by Commissioner Lantelmi. Um, I don't think it's public knowledge on this commission, though it is public knowledge in the world. Uh, Commissioner Lantelmi is chair of the Planning Commission this year and is staying on as our Transportation Commission liaison, um, which is hands down more meetings than any person should attempt to attend as a volunteer in an unpaid position. Uh, so thank you, Commissioner Lantelmi, for... Uh, taking on that mantle on planning commission this year and sticking around um, to to be transportation commission's liaison that is uh, an astounding amount of work and i think transportation commission is already benefiting from uh, having you in that leadership role with this upcoming rpp joint meeting so thank you very much okay. anything else see 
Commissioner Lantelmi's hand, I think, is just still up from earlier. Oh, yeah, I'll take that. But thank you, Chairman Black. <laughs> no worries. Should be down now. <laughs> there you down. go. Anybody else have anything for the good of the commission before we uh, get ready to uh, come back in uh, in February for yet another exciting virtual meeting? All right. And in that case, we are adjourned. Thank you very much uh, to everyone, especially to our three new commissioners who uh, were not afraid to jump right in on their first meeting and ask great questions and give great feedback. Uh, as uh, somebody else already said, I look forward to getting us all together in person sometime in the vague future. <laughs> uh, Pre-COVID, we had uh, we had very strong tradition of meeting up for beer after the commission meeting. Uh, so I look forward to getting back to that at some point in the future. Now we just drink during the meetings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is definitely tea. <laughs> all right. We're adjourned. Thank you all, folks. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Best. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night.